For today's cup of coffee, we have something that's a little bit unusual. And I've got youngest kid here on standby. He's had a rough day on multiple Week. levels. So he's, uh, I think he's, he's decided he's not going to comment that much. He always has the option of commenting or not. And so this is something that he has not heard of before, probably. And there's a lot of other people that may have not heard of this before. And I will say that uh, Backdrop, which was a, is a Russian gas mask, which was gifted to me by BB a few Christmases ago, and I love it. Have always loved it. It's a really cool thing. It is a cool thing, and that's just another thing that we have on our wall of fuckery. Yeah. Because everybody needs a wall of fuckery. Things that people come in and it's like, what is that? Why do you have that? And it's like, because I can. That because Why does anybody have anything? Because, you know, because they can, because they want it. Bud K is an amazing company. And you can buy some really cool stuff there. Who knows? Maybe this gas mask is haunted. I hope not. I hope it was just for training purposes. We don't know that. Well, we don't. Anyhow, this comes from uh, the website Britannica.com and was written by Michael Ray. And um, I think he updated it actually October the 19th of this year. And this is about the Christmas truce of World War One, And it's interesting because in today's world, there has been such extreme focus on World War II that a lot of people have basically all but forgotten World War I. Mm. And the events of World War One were what happened and what led to World War Two. So Or else there wouldn't have been a World War Two. Well and it's like, you know, no no one ever wanted a World War period. You know, the regular people. But anyhow, uh there was a Christmas truce and that lasted December 24th and 25th of 1914, which was an unofficial and impromptu ceasefire that occurred along the Western Front during World War I. The pause in fighting was not universally observed, nor had it been sanctioned by commanders on either side, but along some two-thirds of the 30-mile front controlled by the British uh, forces, the guns fell silent for a short time. The countries of Europe went to war in the summer of 1914 with the enthusiasm and the belief that the conflict would be over by Christmas that year. Within only a few months, however, hundreds of thousands of soldiers had been killed in heavy fighting. And, you know, it's like the theory of war or the thought of war is usually vastly different than the reality of it. Mm -hmm. uh, by December of 1914, uh, the reality of trench warfare had settled in and weeks of heavy rain had turned both the trenches and the no man's land that separated them into cold, muddy morasses. And, I mean, these, these trenches, that's, if you ever heard of trench foot, that is a thing. That is when people's feet are constantly in a moist, wet environment, it can cause, you know, different fungi. It can cause the skin to basically break down. And so that's part of it as far as always keeping your, your feet dry. When, when you go, when you do camping and stuff, that's one of the things always keep your feet dry for those on the western front daily life was miserable but it was a misery that was shared by enemies who were in some places separated by 50 yards or less it's almost insane to think about yeah. and the men in the trenches had seen battle 
but they were as yet untouched by the worst horrors that World War I would produce. And that's where you had like mustard gas attacks and stuff that uh, different poisonous fumes that were being lobbed into the trenches. And yeah, it was just a different type of warfare. You know, all of its, all warfare is, bad. it is bad. And, and unfortunately, sometimes it is necessary. It says in early December, an attempt was made to secure an official truce for the holidays. Pope Benedict the, um, oh my God, that's the fifth, had the Roman numerals there threw me for a loop, had <laughs> ascended to the papacy just a month after the outbreak of war. And on December, December the 7th, he issued an appeal to the leaders of Europe that the guns may fall silent at least upon the night the angels sang. Benedict's hope was that a truce would follow the warring powers to negotiate a fair and lasting peace, but there was little interest from leaders on either side. This did not stop soldiers at the front from seizing the initiative, however, when outside events seemed to provide a path to the truth truce that their leaders had rejected. As December 25th approached, the constant soaking rain gave way to frost, and the battlefields of Flanders were blanketed with a light dusting of snow. Uh, German Emperor William II contributed to the holiday atmosphere when he sent Christmas trees to the front in an effort to bolster morale. On December the 23rd, German soldiers began placing the trees outside of their trenches. They sang hymns such as Silent Night, and voices from the Allied lines responded with Christmas carols of their own. While there were relatively few British troops who spoke German, many Germans had worked in Britain before the war, and this experience facilitated communication between the two groups. Saxon troops, in particular, were credited with initiating a dialogue with the British. So Soldiers on both sides regarded the Saxons as amiable and trustworthy, and the Christmas truce had the mo uh, most success in areas where British troops faced Saxon regiments. The truce was not widely adopted in French-controlled areas on the front. German soldiers had spent 1914 overrunning a huge swath of French territory, and animus towards the occupiers was too strong. There was also no equivalent truce on the Eastern Front, as Russia was still operating under the Julian calendar, and so the Russian Orthodox Christmas would not be observed until early January. By Christmas Eve, some lower-ranking British officers had begun ordering their men not to fire unless fired upon. This policy came to be known as Live and Let Live, and it would be adopted as an ad hoc basis throughout the war, particularly in less active sectors. Like all impl implementations of Live and Let Live, the officers' decisions were made without any authorization from above, and the tenuous truce slowly started to take hold. As the morning broke on Christmas Day, German soldiers emerged from their trenches, waving their arms to demonstrate that they had no ill intent. When it became clear that they were not carrying weapons, British soldiers soon joined them, meeting in no man's land to socialize and exchange gifts. Censorship had not yet been imposed on letters home, and British soldiers wrote of plain soccer or football and sharing food and drink with men who had been, just a day earlier, their mortal enemies. These accounts stress that the men themselves could scarcely believe the remarkable events that were transpiring around them and that they recognized, even in the moment, their unique and historic significance. I was not frivolity, however, as some of the most common activities in areas observing the Christmas truce were joint services to bury the dead. Perhaps recognizing that the peace surely could not last, both sides you uh, also used the cessation of hostilities to improve and reinforce their trenches. There were some casualties as a result of the non-universal implementation of the tru truce, and even among the unit amongst the units which observed the ceasefire, not all men approved of the decision. 
In the days following Christmas, violence returned to the Western Front, although the truce persisted until after New Year's days and some in some areas. British and German generals quickly took steps to prevent any further episodes of fraternization between their men. Attempts to revive the truce on Christmas Day of 1915 were quashed, and there were no subsequent widespread ceasefires on the Western Front until the Armistice of November 1918. And I think that there was a song or a poem or something at some point that said, what if they held a war and no one came? Mm. And so we always wonder these things. You have people that sit and send other people's sons to die. Now, I have a question on that. Sure. If they all, like most of them agreed, you know, to have a truce and they even conversated about how horrific this all was. Sure. Why didn't they start to look back and be like, you know what? This is bullshit. Right. This is all needless. Why don't we <clears throat> rebel against the ones who are telling us to do this? Right. Well, that's always a good question. And um, there was a movie that is called uh, Baron Munchausen. The, I think it's The Fabulous Adventures of Baron Munchausen or whatever. Mm-hmm. And that movie, which did not do well at the box office, has a remarkable amount of truth in it. That and we go as far as like the Milgram experiment, where somebody was standing there with a clipboard saying, do this, and people did, you know? And that they actually would have killed another person just because someone told them to do that. Uh, We also have the Stanford Prison Experiment, which as far as this imbalance of power, where you had the ones that were put in the role of being the officers or or the, you know, uh, guards, and then the other ones were supposed to be the inmates, Mm -hmm. and how quickly that imbalance of power took over, excuse me, took over these people that were not really officers not really inmates. They were, you know, they were very much equal. They were college kids. Yeah. So it's sort of the same thing within when when you get in the military and stuff. You've got those people that, oh, I'm officer. I'm a ranking officer. You are a, you know, whatever, lower ranking whatever. So therefore you have to do what I say. Now, in times in the past, could they take physical, physically uh, abuse those that were under their uh, command? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, any, for anybody who doubts that, go back and I can't remember when it was. Uh, it was Marines, I do believe it was at Camp Lejeune or whatever it was, where the drill instructor had marched these guys through this swamp or whatever, and basically all of them died. You know? Mm-hmm. And so you've got some people, it's like, is it for the protection of a country or is it just about power and control for a few? And and I don't know that this, that there was any e- easy what answer. What it is, it's about power, con- I, I, there is an easy answer. It's about power and control for the few. You know? Period. That they start wars and they... You know, we have seen recently how much, you know, that the people have been lied to. Mm-hmm. Still are being lied yeah, to. Yeah, and, and it's like the people across the world. Mm-hmm. That they're like, oh, you know, my my people, my, my children went, they served, they believed in this cause. And then to find out that the cause was bogus. Yeah. I, I mean, and that's... Every nation does this stuff. But if there's also the, the thought, if we don't fight, would other countries come in and take over? Absolutely. Yeah. So there's no easy answers. 
And World War One, it was a matter of one of the czars that he was assassinated. I think that's, I can't remember what her name was, Anastasia or something like that, I think was one of the kids that they thought had survived. And it's remarkably easy to get people behind a cause, especially when you've got somebody that is a fiery, passionate speaker and that emotion takes over rather than rational thought. And we've seen that many times as far as rallying the troop, uh, you know, the troops, as far as you've got somebody that is a one is wonderful with words, knows exactly how to trigger those emotions. A lot of them have these lies. It's like, oh, well, if they don't get, if we don't get them, they'll get us. But it, usually it's not their asses on the lines. They're back there pushing papers. Uh, I don't know what they're doing, playing actual chess while other people are really dying. Mm -hmm. You know. And it's like, God, help us. Any of us who grew up, you know, my grandfather fought in World War II. My father, my birth was the reason he didn't have to go to Vietnam. Um, you know, the great, aunt, the great uncle whose house that we live in, he was sent to Korea. Mm -hmm. And so many of these things and that we have been so blessed in America for so long that we have forgotten the sacrifice of others. You know? Yeah. Some of these other nations, it's not been that long, you know, for them since they've had war and armed conflict in their country and stuff. And a lot of those people, when they come here, they appreciate this nation more than a lot of the people that were born here. Ask some of those people from Cuba. You know, ask some of those people from, uh, you know, South Korea or the ones that may have come here from North Korea. You know, some of these other places. Ask some of the folks that come here from Nigeria and, and you know, and they can tell you what it was like where they came from. And it's fascinating when you get an opportunity to hear some of these people. Yeah. So, Christmas truce during World War One, And there is actually this amazing song. I love it. It's about Snoopy and the Red Baron that was inspired by this. Mm -hmm. And I did find uh, that, and I will put it in the description box so that people can listen to it if they've never heard it. Yeah. And we hear that to, uh, you know, uh, peace on earth to man. Yeah. Do you know that that is a mistranslation? My one and only semester in Latin, when I was sitting there going, Dr. Morris, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I was in there with all the seminary students, me with my skull earring and my Aussie t-shirt. <laughs> And he called out by the teacher. Oh, no, he didn't. He just left me alone. He actually, yeah. he would, you know, sit and chain smoke. You could still do that back then. And, um, but he translated all these different languages. He was an amazing man. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the first things he said that the actual translation is peace on earth to men of goodwill. Yeah. So, how many other mistranslations? Yeah. There's a lot out there. Sure. But it's a matter of us also being that goodwill and doing our best to bring that peace. Yeah. Yeah. So, if you've had experiences with paranormal, supernatural encounters, UFOs, aliens, cryptids, Snoopy on his doghouse, flying, I think it was a sop with camel or something. Tom Nook. He got a Tom Nook today. It's a little bit of an early present. King of capitalism. Oh, yeah. 
So if you've got local, regional, family myths or legends, and we've actually had um, our beloved Yates, who who just, he does not speak ADHD, but we still love you. And so actually over there in England, he had sent several stories to us, encounters, um, as far as some of the battlegrounds that you could see the the ghost of the different soldiers and stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, even including where someone had told him about a Roman soldier. We've read some of those, haven't oh, we? Oh, yeah, we've, we've read all of them that he sent us. Yeah. So those were much earlier cups. You'll have to search back through on that one. Mm-hmm. Um, but I always think of him with the history because he's a huge history buff. Yeah. So if any of your family has legends about um, the wars and stuff like that you'd like to share... Or that you just, if you don't want a video made about them, that's okay, too. If you want just someone to listen, hey, we do that pretty good. Yeah. Send us an email, cupofcoffee with scream at gmail.com. And prayers for youngest kids so that he will hopefully feel better and be himself soon. Yeah. Yes, I'm pumping him full of ashwagandha and rhodiola. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's doing the herbs. I, but that's she's what doing I do. Homeopathic. That's what I do. Absolutely. SOS. No, no. We'll fix you some more kava tea tonight. <sighs> the kava tea is good. It was not good. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, know that you are are loved and appreciated, and uh, thank you for taking the time to have coffee with us this morning. Yes. And we'll see you on the next cup. Mm-hmm. Don't forget to like, share, <coughs> cough, comment, <laughs> and subscribe. Bye. Bye.